Uh, welcome everybody. It's uh, our pleasure to start uh, with our first webinar of uh, the year uh, already 2016, and uh, we uh, are doing it I mean, with uh, a very uh, interesting uh, topic. It's actually uh, based on a paper recently released uh, about uh, the secondary effects of Truvada uh, for oral prep. And the, the paper is entitled, Is Truvada Safer Than Aspirin? And uh, it's going to be presented by uh, the senior author of the paper, uh, Dr. Jeff Klausner. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, we, we have uh, Dr. Meyer's uh, comments as well. He is, um, to us, uh, uh, Jeff, uh, both Jeff and Ken are at the meeting in in Atlanta at the CDC, and uh, uh, it's not sure if um, Jeff, if Ken is going to join us, but we'll try to, because he already sent his comments, uh, but uh, he's at the meeting he didn't know uh, they were going to have. So uh, anyway, we hope he will be joining us. And uh, but definitely, we realize there are many people with uh, potential comments about the paper. So. Uh, we may need more time for that. For that. Anyway, uh, so I would uh, mention that Dr. Klausner is a professor of medicine and the division of infectious diseases at the, uh, the, the program of global health uh, at uh, UCLA. He is a very well-known researcher in, in STIs and HIV. And you can read uh, a full uh, um, paragraph about his uh, uh, CV and all the things he does. He's a very active, extremely productive uh, researcher and uh, always with uh, interesting ideas about how to do uh, things differently and better. So um, I think uh, it's a very, uh, it's my pleasure to, to introduce uh, uh, Jeff today. Uh, I can say about uh, Ken Meyer, uh, Dr. Meyer, that he's a uh, uh, besides being a, a friend as well, he's professor at Harvard Medical School, and uh, he's uh, a leader you know, in, in uh, uh, healthcare for uh, key populations in uh, for for men who have sex with men, gay men, in uh, at the Fenway Institute uh, in Boston, and uh, he's also extremely active as a researcher. So they have uh, been having exchanges about the topic of. Uh, Today's presentation, which is, and given the, uh, the discussions that uh, prep use have generated in the U.S., it's a very uh, interesting paper to introduce the the very discussion of secondary effects of uh, of Truvada you know, by comparing to the use of Truvada with the use of aspirin. So, uh, I won't. I I will stop here. I will just say that. Um, We'll have the, the chat window open, and if people have comments, please uh, write the comments or questions in uh, in the chat window. Also, that um, this session is going to be recorded and will be released through our YouTube channel later. So, uh, uh, thanks again, Jeff, for being here, and, and please uh, feel free to start. All right, well, thank you very much, Professor Caceres. Uh, today is January 27th, uh, 2016. It is um, 9.30 a.m. here in Atlanta. I'm at a uh, CDC meeting. So, Carlos, will you be showing the slides and advancing the slides? Okay, so as we get the um, slides up on the screen, I will give a little bit of background um, how I came to this question. So currently I do a fair amount of training of medical providers around the United States and how to use PrEP, uh, for whom it's indicated, how to uh, manage risk reduction and uh, monitoring of side effects, what are the appropriate HIV tests to use in terms of uh, diagnosis, how to implement it within their primary care um, systems and as I was giving a talk on this in a workshop in Atlanta, um, it, there, some questions came up around safety and I made a somewhat offhanded comment that, you know, Travada um, um, is actually as safe as aspirin and 
I thought about that um, after I said it, and I said, well, what, actually, what's the evidence for that? And um, if we looked at data from the clinical PrEP trials and then from the Aspen trials, would that be able to inform that question? All right, here we go. Um, so let's go to uh, slide two. All right, so okay. there were, you know, as, as I've been giving these uh, PrEP implementation trainings and workshop, um, people are actually quite impressed by the um, efficacy and the effectiveness data, and I think the field has done an outstanding job of demonstrating that when taken regularly, uh, PrEP works. Um, but there still is a continued uh, concern among both prescribers users and policymakers um, about long-term safety. Um, in the United States, there's, uh, while we do use prophylactic medications um, extensively, so think about lipid-lowering medications to prevent car cardiovascular disease, um, you think about um, estrogen supplements, um, some women that used to be uh, quite popular to prevent uh, breast cancer, and then the most commonly used um, prophylactic is um, aspirin, and actually um, it's the number one most widely used prescribed uh, prophylactic in, uh, in the United States, and um, about a fifth of all adults um, take aspirin prophylactically and half of adults 45 to 75 years of age. So very common, um, high exposure, and commonly, commonly used. But when people were talking about Truvada, they were concerned, well, it's a daily medication. Um, how are they going to fit that into their um, lifestyle? Aspirin's office is also a daily medication uh, when used prophylactically. Giving medications to people without HIV. So in terms of the benefit-risk ratio, we certainly know giving medications to people with HIV have you know, tremendous benefit-to-risk ratio. But people without HIV and doctors um, are generally somewhat reluctant to prescribe prophylactic medications to young, otherwise healthy individuals, fearing uh, medium and long-term side effects. And um, also there was, there was continued concern about, well, what is the long-term follow-up data? And um, the knowledge that the, that the studies that are done, and this was one of Dr. Mayer's comments that we'll get to uh, after my presentation, the studies that were done are in a highly select group of healthy individuals, um, and that may differ from the general population. So this is kind of the background of you know why I felt um, it was important to look at something widely used like aspirin, and then look at some of the data we have on um, adverse events related to Truvada. Next slide. Um, and then aspirin finally has had two uh, very large uh, prevention trials uh, with over a um, half a million person years of observation. Uh, so the uh, physician's health study and the women's health study um, both reported in the New England, New England Journal of Medicine over the past couple decades. Also uh, the PrEP trials reported in the New England Journal of Medicine. So also thought in terms of um, comparing reported events, the fact that all these studies were in the same journal, um, there might be some uniformity on how the journal required the authors to report um, adverse events, adverse event rates, um, and that might uh, also build a stronger study. So trying to compare as best uh, one could uh, like with like in terms of the area of interest that we were looking at, which were um, adverse events. Next. So um, the tenofovir um, FTC studies had um, a reasonable amount of overall follow-up time. As you know, follow-up time is a combination um, outcome of the number of people uh, followed over a specific amount of time. So the IPREX trial, for example, could be 3,000 people each follow for about a year, um, or it could be you know, 33 people. Uh, fall for um, um, uh, um, 100 years, and that still gives the same amount of person years. So um, the average follow-up time in all these studies um, was 
relatively modest, um, about one to uh, two years. Um, some may have gone out to uh, three years, but generally modest amount of uh, follow-up time, but still give, gives us in total over 20,000 person years to look at, and particularly when we're looking at um, adverse events and things that occur at a low event frequency, you want to have a uh, larger denominator and you want to have um, ideally thousands of person years to see something you know that would occur um, more than one in a thousand times in a given year. So by combining and looking at these uh, five studies, we increase our observation time and our denominator for uh, finding um, events. And then also because these five studies are done different countries around the world, uh, males, females, um, heterosexuals, men of sex and men, um, it, it, it gives enhanced generalizability in terms of uh, robustness uh, when you look for different events. Next. Now, as I mentioned, the aspirin, the aspirin studies even had a larger amount of uh, follow-up time because these were uh, studies that were done uh, for at least 10 years in uh, tens of thousands of individuals and the reason for that is they were really looking for a, a small effect size. So, so they were not expecting you know a 92 percent reduction in risk events as we saw with people who took uh, PrEP every day in terms of HIV incidence but they were looking for you know a, a modest maybe a 10 percent um, effect in a number of cardiovascular events, but because cardiovascular events like heart attacks and uh, strokes are are um, you know so important in the overall general population, uh, clinically a 10% reduction in event rate uh, would be meaningful, you know, particularly on a on a public health scale. So that's why these uh, studies were much much um, larger, but also these larger studies give us a little bit more information on the true frequency of adverse on adverse events. Next. And then um, we had to come up with a metric or some kind of measure that we could use across the different studies. And many people are probably familiar with the number needed to treat and that is a, a metric that policymakers um, often use and um, physician groups and sometimes individual physicians think about that um, when they're doing an intervention. So how many people do they have to treat with aspirin to prevent uh, one heart attack? How many people do they have to treat with lipid lowering medications like statins to pr prevent a, a heart attack? And usually those numbers are you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 on up. So um, individuals um, are at risk for, you know, not benefiting from being on the prophylactic, but um, at a population level, uh, you expect to see that benefit. And, you know, the best data we right now have with with PrEP, um, it depends, of course, on the incidence uh, and the and the population you're looking at. But anywhere from from a number needed to treat as um, low as 6 to 12 to 15 uh, vary by um, adherence in that population as well but these are you know very favorable number needed to treat so the flip side of that number needed to treat is the number needed to harm so instead of looking for you know favorable outcomes like prevention of disease in this case we're looking for unfavorable outcomes like harms associated with a um, with an intervention or a uh, medication. And the harms we were looking at were, were the adverse events. Um, so basically, we can calculate a rate of adverse events that occurred over the uh, follow-up time. So that's the number of user years in both the intervention and placebo group. And another important attribute of these um, seven studies that were looked at was they were all placebo controlled. Um, which um, is important because there are reports of adverse events that occur in patients who are assigned to placebo. So people are assigned to placebo in clinical trials, we know they will report uh, nausea, vomiting, headache, uh, pain, discomfort, psychological um, stress, even though they're on a um, quote, placebo, a medication with no active ingredient. 
and that's, that enables us to discern what the true event rate is related to the intervention or the medication under study versus kind of the background rate of, um, of headaches and discomfort that people get um, on a daily basis that might might not be related to the new medication. So when we normalize uh, these rates um, by 100 user years, we um, subtract the number of adverse events in the intervention or the number of adverse events of the placebo from the number of adverse events in the intervention, and we get a difference in adverse events per 100 user years, and then we um, invert that, one over that difference, and then we get the number immediate to harm. So for example, if a number needed to harm is 50 for a specific um, adverse event such as headache, that would mean you'd have to treat uh, 50, 50 people um, for a year to uh, see one headache, um, which you know would be a relatively, arguably, infrequent event. So the number needed to harm was the metric uh, that we used uh, for this analysis. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so Carl, so if you could um, enlarge this however you can, it would be great. But this is um, essentially the primary uh, figure from the uh, study report. And I've made available both an internet link to the study and a PDF of the um, study uh, manuscript, the proof of the manuscript. So, you know, the work I do, I always want to be able to share and disseminate and people have access to and feel free to share and to, to disseminate the study and this talk as well. And what this table shows um, on the left is the um, number of um, excess cases of any particular adverse event among the PrEP users, and then on the right, the number of excess cases um, for any specific event for the aspirin users, and then uh, basically one over that um, excess number of cases gives you the number needed to harm. Now, we only report here the statistically significant um, events that were different between those who were receiving placebo and the intervention. And one area we don't uh, report on because it was not consistently measured or reported in the uh, studies of PrEP was the issue of bone mineral density. And that's the second point that uh, Dr. Mayer um, brought up is the issue of bone mineral density. Um, however, um, in the text of the uh, manuscript of the publication, um, we, we do report that um, that there was a number needed to harm a five for a small one percent average decrease in bone density um, of the spine and a small one half of one percent in the hip over one study in a six month follow up. So not all studies included um, routine measurement of bone marrow density. And as you know, in the current guidelines for PrEP use, none of the guidelines include routine measurement of bone mineral density. And importantly, um, in none of the PrEP studies was there any uh, reported uh, bone fractures, um, adverse pregnancy-related events, or any permanent renal failure. But if we look at the data in front of you, um, you can see we further categorized it by gender, men uh, versus women. And um, among men in the PrEP trials, um, very low frequency of excess um, uh, events of unintentional weight loss or uh, nausea, um, such that, you know, be about 100 uh, people have to treat to see these um, events. And remember, this is different than placebo. And then in, 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 in the women, um, in the trials, they did see um, some increases in abnormal liver enzymes, uh, vomiting, and nausea, and it um, took about between 40 and 50 people to treat to see those adverse events, and then also um, increase in uh, serum creatinine. It was the number needed to harm there was about uh, 72. So you had a mixture of adverse events related to people's um, symptom uh, reporting, uh, nausea and vomiting, and then increase in adverse events related to laboratory tests of abnormalities such as liver enzymes 
and CM creatinine, and then the bone mineral density that I uh, mentioned. Now on the other side, you see the events associated with aspirin use, and here among men, um, you see that there were, um, you know, increased number of adverse events associated with aspirin use, although they were also uh, uncommon. Uh, but some of them certainly could be serious, particularly uh, types of bleeding and where that bleeding might occur. But um, the number needed to harm was only 15 uh, for any bleeding problems. Um, easy bruising, epistaxis or nosebleed was about 50. Other types of bleeding, so bleeding is a known, uh, you know, quote, side effect of aspirin, and this kind of shows you what the expected uh, frequency of that is. Then um, ulcers of gastrointestinal ulcers or duodenal ulcers um, um, e um, even more rare. And uh, you know, one can see that at least the, the bleeding events are around the same order of frequency um, as the um, events occurring in the uh, PrEP patients. And then scrolling down a little bit, um, in women, uh, one can see um, also um, bruising and um, bleeding as well. Let me just pull up my slide on that. Um, bleeding as well and, and also um, gastrointestinal ulcers. So really the same types of adverse events um, in women and men with a similar frequency of occurrence. Next. Thanks. There we go. Okay, so you know, in summary from the data I have presented, there was a comparable frequency but different types of adverse events with um, FTC PDF. We had uh, nausea, vomiting, weight loss, and reversible laboratory or radiologic um, at, um, abnormalities um, in in the populations that were studied. Now there's you know other studies that are have been um, coming out that are not. Um, published yet, and we can talk about those in the discussion. Um, aspirin had a different set of events, bleeding, bruising, and ulcers, um, but a similar frequency of events. Um, in both um, patient populations, we're talking about thousands of, tens of thousands of, uh, of uh, patient years of observation, hundreds of thousands with aspirin. They were very rare, any serious adverse events, and um, no deaths, and I'll you know iterate that um, in none of the uh, prep trials were there any bone fractures, adverse pregnancy-related events, or any permanent uh, renal damage. Next. So our conclusion was that um, FTC and TDF for prep uh, safety compared favorably with aspirin. However, there's um, you know, no limitations to these data. The follow-up time was limited, um, only um, a couple or at the max um, a few years um, in the uh, Trivada um, groups. The study populations, particularly for the um, PrEP trials, um, uh, were um, highly selective of, you know, healthy Young young individuals, uh, people were pre-screened for you know decreased creatinine clearance. People may pre-screened for other chronic medical conditions. Um, but you know the main aim of the study was to demonstrate um, efficacy, and then um, so the internal validity or getting the right study population um, with a high rate of incident HIV would be uh, very important. Um, and then adherence, as we know, varied. So adherence from this perspective um, is important in terms of the adverse events and the difference between placebo because if you know half the patient population or study population is not taking medication, they're obviously not going to have adverse related events. So um, arguably in other larger populations that are taking uh, PrEP every day that are taking it um, with other uh, concomitant medications um, that have other chronic medical conditions um, that may affect their renal function, um, hypertension, diabetes, um, etc. 
um, we may see different uh, rates of adverse events. Next. So I do think, though, that uh, these data and this analysis should um, enable providers and patients to be reassured um, about the safety. I think you know um, the purpose of the study was to provide uh, reassurance, but also um, to be somewhat provocative and increase the discussion um, about um, the availability uh, with both PrEP and aspirin. Uh, nowhere in the study do we talk about um, you know make, recommending or making it over the counter, which would be a you know a medication available without a prescription. Uh, in the United States, and nowhere do we talk about you know taking the medication without regular medical monitoring. So um, that dialogue and the discussion kind of happened outside of what the study presented. And um, at at this point, I think there'd be a lot more um, data that need, would need to have to be um, looked at and accrued to move in that direction. Um, but from the analysis we did on the current on those patient populations that, um, 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 in the studies, I think the safety profile is quite reassuring. Next. I think that's the last one. Okay, so I think that's my last slide and I purposefully um, you know kept this presentation uh, about 30 minutes, so we would have time for discussion. Uh, Dr. Mayer and I are both at a CDC syphilis meeting. He's been um, has to participate in an executive session at this point, um, so he won't be available to provide commentary. But I can share with you his uh, four points, uh, um, and then we'll open it up further. So um, his four points were number one. Um, creatinine and renal function, the trial selected patients with normal renal function, um, what would happen in the real world. And you know, right now it is only FDA approved for patients with a creatinine clearance over 60. Um, we, you know, HIV care providers and infectious disease and physicians in general know how to dose medications for people with chronic renal insufficiency. Um, that technically would be off-label use, but um, it can be done. But you know, our, to his point, um, it, it is a select patient population, so we don't know about the safety in um, patients with chronic renal disease. Um, number two, um, he raises issues about bone health uh, with youth, and specifically identifies a trial called the Adolescent Trial Network 110. Um, who among those who were adherent had significant decreases in bone mineral, mineral density, and in that study it was primarily 18 to 20 year old to 21 year olds, and um, you know that ra does raise an issue about um, populations that are different state of you know human development when there is a lot more bone turnover in late adolescence and uh, as a young adult what with the impact as this medication might and um, I don't believe there's any known information on the benefits of um, routine exercise, vitamin D supplementation, um, and certainly this does raise uh, the topic of you know when um, TAF, TAF becomes available, um, you know would that potentially be preferable but um, that's a whole other dialogue and I'm not sure what the marketing plans for that drug are. Um, his third point was about um, acute infections that um, you know patients on Truvada for PrEP need, need to be seen more frequently than aspirin um, to be able to monitor adherence and to avoid selection for resistant strains. And um, so that's kind of an argument about why it should not be over the counter and should be used under you know regular physician monitoring. So people um, can get frequent can get frequent HIV tests. Although you know now there's potential plenty of ways for people to get HIV tests without having to go to a physician's office. But there's the other test that may currently still only be available through a physician. And then number four, 
which is part of what I'm here at the CDC uh, syphilis meeting talking about is the you know high rate of STDs and the importance of regular screening, which specifically to me um, do not you know speak to the safety issue from the medications directly in terms of toxicity, but just speak to the overall um, potential disinhibition or risk behavior and uh, Changes in contact rate and economy go along with uh, prep use that you know means should be taken with with interventions to uh, re re reduce those adverse behavioral outcomes. And finally, Ken Dr. Mara says that none of these issues alter his enthusiasm for tenofovir FTC for prep, um, but he he does believe we're not at the over-the-counter uh, stage like aspirin just yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, great. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Jeff. It's been a very interesting uh, uh, discussion, and uh, I would really, at this point, I already wrote um, a message for people to. Um, actually, since we have a, b a bit more time, I guess we could have. Uh, I mean, if there's an opportunity, we do have. We, we can have an open discussion, so people could perhaps. Indicate uh, if they are um, available. If, if they would like to to make a comment, uh, I mean they, they can have a mic. So uh, for the time being, if anybody would like to to make a question, okay. I could uh, while we uh, wait for questions or, or comments that people can indicate. I can. I could actually ask you, Jeff, um, to what extent um, these studies, because of the kind of populations we are comparing and the, the kinds of uh, uh, secondary effects we're talking about, uh, can we talk about uh, comparability? No? So is for the typical people receiving uh, uh, aspirin uh, a specific nausea effect similar to, to what uh, actually, it's not nausea. No, it's a that's uh, GI problems in general. Are, are those comparable to nausea among uh, people with? Um, uh, I mean, using prep, uh, for example. So, what, what would you say? Yeah. So the question is about um, the different gastrointestinal effects and. Um, I think that the mechanisms of the gastrointestinal effects are different. So aspirin being a um, essentially prostaglandin um, inhibitor um, kind of reduces the uh, protective muc mucus coat on the stomach and the duodenum and allows the exposure of underlying mucosa to the you know high acid, uh, high pH content um, there, and um, allows you know, for um, ulceration uh, to occur. So, you know, aspirin itself is salicylic acid, so it's a um, it's an acidic uh, chemical, which can potentially further cause you know these types of um, ulcerations, as opposed to the chemical ingredients of uh, Truvada. Um, I think their um, their kind of effects that cause nausea. Uh, loss of appetite and um, associated weight loss are probably related to their effects on the brain, um, so central effects. Um, and the different mechanisms um, would mean that different populations are potentially have different risks. So the aspirin is generally used in an older population, and the studies were also um, in older populations as they're looking for events like heart attacks, which generally occur in uh, people over 50. Um, and in uh, people over 50, they tend to have a little different physiolo uh, physiology as well um, in their um, stomach, and um, maybe a, you know a different kind of risk for these um, um, ulcers, which generally uh, manifest by pain, um, kind of a feeling, an emptiness in the stomach, um, a feeling of um, of kind of discomfort. Uh, you know, particularly after eating, uh, whereas the uh, nausea and the vomiting from the Truvada uh, 
seem to be a little bit different. So while they both have GI side effects, I think their mechanisms are different and their manifestations also may be a little bit different. Uh, okay, great. Um, I think there's a question from uh, Carlos Laudari, uh, but uh, I don't see your mic, so maybe, uh, you should turn it on, perhaps, because it should show uh, blue. Is your mic blue? Okay. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Very, very good presentation, very interesting study. I'm thinking on a very practical use of this information, of this study, that is in really uh, getting the engagement of the MSM individuals at risk on the use of PrEP with this informed decision making. And my question to the author is this. For the general uh, MSM population that you're uh, addressing in this study, was the comparison of the safety of Truvada and aspirin a good one or another medicine for prevention would be more useful for that specific group in understanding the safety issues? Yeah, so I understand your point, Carlos. So um, if ultimately we're trying to use this data to um, kind of reassure and persuade a specific population, such as young men or sex of men or men or sex men, men at risk for HIV infection, um, that population is not using aspirin for heart attack prevention um, in general. And are there other medications that they use um, that they would understand uh, more directly? And as I'm speaking, I'm thinking about you know what other medications other than antibiotics, but maybe antibiotics you know would be appropriate, like doxycycline or, you know, amoxicillin or ciprofloxacin or ceftriaxone or antibiotics we use to treat people for bacterial sexually transmitted infections um, or other medications like vitamins, um, multivitamins that people uh, might take. Um, another, you know, prophylactic medication obviously not taken routinely in MSM would be oral contraceptives. Um, now, using the antibiotics, the challenge there is that um, those are usually not used long term and they're not necessarily used prophylactically unless someone's thinking about doxycycline or other medications people use for malaria uh, prophylaxis. Um, so, in the short term, you know, we could say that, you know, this would be very similar to the penicillin or doxycycline you might get, uh, but we wouldn't necessarily have that long-term comparison. So I'd be interested to hear from you, you know, what other medications do you think that um, the target population would understand uh, more and have more experience with using? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I think you addressed exactly the, 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 the those that I was having in mind, but my, my main question was I was really curious to see if you have already used the the findings of the article to address uh, behavior change uh, counseling in terms of if this is was a useful uh, comparison for uh, really making uh, uh, people change their mind and saying, okay, I think it's 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 safe to take prep. Right. So that's a great question, and I think um, I mean some of the early evidence I have on that is that um, you know once the findings were reported, um, the information really went viral on the um, different LGBT English um, <coughs> speaking websites and you know magazines and periodicals um, 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 around the world. So there were you know dozens or scores that ran articles um, without any marketing or press release um, on our effort. Um, so, you know, people were very interested in this and they wanted to uh, share the information. Um, I do not have yet any um, knowledge about how this information has been um, used in uh, clinical practice or any um, information or any data to show that this information 
has had any um, impact, you know, on kind of trends in the uptake of testing. Um, I'm not aware that, you know, any major organizations like WHO or CDC are going to, you know, include or how they might include this information. Um, in terms of, you know, when they those organizations do include information, they do look to the highest level of evidence, and this was not a randomized controlled trial. So, I mean, ultimately the best level of evidence would be to take young men, randomly assign half to Truvada, half to aspirin, and then monitor them for 10 years to look at, you know, the frequency of side effects. Um, that's not going to happen, and uh, it's not feasible, necessarily desirable. So th this is the type of kind of best evidence, um, you know, we would have. And because it is, you know, kind of a lower quality of evidence, um, sometimes those uh, esteemed organizations do not want to include this type of evidence. But um, the fact that um, a lot of different organizations are now aware of this, um, I think it is a good question to think about how are they using this information and has it having any impact. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, great. I had a question about uh, the plans in uh, Gilead to replace, actually to, to release a new um, tenofovir or a, a, a new drug, a new combination of uh, uh, Tenofovir and MTC Trevin. Uh, would that, I mean, uh, potentially you're going to uh, um, present it as a, as a much better option uh, with lower uh, secondary effects. Would that perhaps uh, affect people's perception of uh, Truvada safety? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I've been asking different people about that question. So you're referring to the use of TAF as a substitute for TDF, and we know TAF can be um, have similar efficacy, but at a much lower dose. So I think the don't quote me on this, but it's either 25 or 35 milligrams in the uh, you know new pr new proposed dose, which would be you know um, substantially lower, and also in the clinical trials for people with HIV where they've used TAF. They have shown lower rates of uh, changes in creatinine clearance and bone min mineral density. Now, for the manufacturer to get a new indication for TAF um, as you know, Truvada safe or whatever you want to call it, um, they'd have to go through you know a new clinical trial process. And uh, given the, the cost complexity of that, I'm not sure that they would. Um, motivated to pursue that, but I don't know, and uh, maybe other people on the phone um, do know. And, um, uh, you know, secondly, um, to use um, a TAF-containing um, uh, uh, combination Truvada pill, uh, physicians in the United States can, can use it um, without it having to be FDA approved. So we, so we can do what's called off-label use, and if we think, you know, a certain form formulation might be safer or more beneficial but has the same efficacy. Um, the FDA doesn't control medical practice, um, so we could do that. Now there's the third issue there about the cost. And um, some skeptics say, you know, the only reason why Gilead is bringing TAF to the market um, is because, you know, they'll have a new 20-year patent on this, uh, new, on this new product and then they'll be able to um, you know, retain their uh, cost recovery through the exclusive sales of the new product, and generics would not be um, available. Um, but you know, what happened outside the United States in terms of um, generics and the availability of TAF? Um, you know, I don't really know what that's going to uh, look like. But um, you know, I'd have to say, you know, yes, uh, TAF has the potential to um, even have fewer side effects um, and a lower frequency of uh, adverse events. But if you look at the data, the frequency is already very low. And, um, you know, specifically the changes in creatinine clearance are, are reversible. Um, you know, maybe TAF um, 
because it would be, you know, maybe an order of magnitude um, safer, you know, could be considered on that movement uh, for um, over the counter. But that's pure speculation, uh, but does provide interesting discussion. Yeah, very interesting. So, well, in fact, I'm sure that uh, uh, they will try to, I mean, uh, to position the new drug in the market, obviously because it will have a new patent and everything. But I have, I had also heard that perhaps they would try, they would be willing to to position this new drug for treatment and leave uh, Truval for prevention. No, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that might be something they. Uh, do because in that way perhaps it would be uh, and it would be able to s segment the market in, in a way that is convenient. Right, right, and and and, and also I should add that um, you know some providers may not feel comfortable using TAF um, for primary prevention of HIV because it has not been proven and. Um, you know, it, it will be a lower dose, um, and you know, there's still a lot of unknowns about where the concentration of medication is critical. Um, I think we believe it is the intracellular concentration, um, but you know, without you know clinical studies, some people may feel not comfortable about using it, and probably you know the kind of normative bodies of CDC and WHO. Would not feel comfortable, you know, recommending it, um, you know, without true clinical efficacy data. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. There's one question from uh, Mario uh, Mario Forte. I don't know, Mario. Would you like to to make the question yourself, or would you like me to to read it? You, uh, you go ahead and read. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Oh, well, actually, I mean, if you have a mic, please go ahead yourself. Okay, um, one of the barriers that, I, that I've that i experienced with prescribers in, in my area, in my region, is uh, is an unwillingness to prescribe because they, they are concerned about the risk to ratio that what you said earlier about prescribing uh, medicine to otherwise healthy individuals. Um, so my question is, um, do you see that a, a study, is it possible that a study like this could uh, uh, adjust CDC's protocol and recommendation to prescribers about the 90-day monitoring protocols and and just ease their uh, concerns that would make them more uh, open to prescribe? That's, a, that's another very good question. Um, you know, I think I did see some commentary from Don Smith from the um, CDC who was aware of this new study um, and I, my sense from her commentary was that this was not going to be, you know, a, a pivotal study that would uh, necessarily change things. But I think, you know, additional studies and um, larger amount of evidence done in different ways might. Um, one of the challenges with, you know, reducing the 90-day monitoring frequency is people's concerns about missing incident HIV infection, missing the opportunity to do the bacterial STI screening. Um, but, you know, it is possible um, it could reduce, you know, recommendations for frequency of, you know, creatinine clearance uh, monitoring, which is kind of their primary recommendation. And I do believe, you can correct me, you know, that that, you know, 90-day frequency does go down after the first year um, to be less often. Um, but you know, at the meeting I'm at right now, we want PrEP users coming in every three months to get tested if there's no other testing, um, particularly for STD testing, um, in their community. Now, as we try to be more um, innovative and provide access for, pe for people to get tested without having to see a provider, so like the Dean Street Express model in London, provider free testing. Um, we have some provider free testing programs in Los Angeles uh, as pilot projects. But as we try to do more provider free STD and HIV testing, um, you know, there may be legitimate pushback on the, you know, 90 day visit 
uh, requirements. Um, so I think we'll have to wait and see. Okay. Great. Um, I think we still have a couple of minutes, so I don't know if there's anybody else uh, with a question or comment. I mean, the, ma the microphone is open, so people can uh, ask if they want directly. Otherwise, we can end early. I don't know. Is there any any question? Uh, okay. Well, otherwise, uh, I mean, it's been a very interesting uh, visit of a, of a of a topic that in I mean in uh, at this time in in implementation in many places is a very uh, legitimate question and uh, it's one of, it's based on or focuses on one of the concerns that some people have expressed so it's Im important to have uh, evidence you know, uh, that is that relates to what and the, the typical categories people use to to for example judge uh, safety of particular drug in comparison with something that is well known uh, for its use in prevention, so uh, which is what this study has actually done. So anyway, I think um, this is something we'll keep thinking of. And uh, again, Jeff, thanks very much uh, for uh, your presentation today. Uh, Ken uh, obviously wasn't able to join us, but uh, he left his uh, his comments. So what we'll do is to um, complete the, this recording and and uh, and. Uh, circulated later and uh, please uh, um, keep uh, looking for our updates and uh, we'll, we'll keep in touch about this. So again, thanks uh, very much Jeff and uh, thanks everybody for participating. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for, for joining and thank you Carlos for organizing. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. Take care.